There it is. I was looking at the wrong screen. I was like, why isn't it live? Got more than one screen up. Welcome to Vlog Thursday number 358, Home Lab Tech Talk and Live Q&A. Happy Thanksgiving for those of you that are celebrating Thanksgiving. I pretty much, I think it's just a U.S. holiday, but uh, I believe, like any holiday, uh, probably there's people celebrating things elsewhere because uh, the interesting thing about holidays is it's kind of fun to just mix all the cultures and say, Hey, let's do this over here. I don't know. I have friends outside the U S uh, that, you know, maybe because they brought their U S heritage with them are celebrating it either way. That's why I'm doing it early in the morning today is I have lots to do. Traditionally Thanksgiving is a day that uh, people get together, eat a lot of food and there's a lot of family things usually going on. So I didn't want to one people who want to get, catch the stream go, Oh, look, I can't really participate live because I'm doing family things. Also myself, I'll be doing family things. So, uh, that's why I'm doing it now. Anyways, that little long ramble right there. Welcome everyone. There's not as many people here in the morning uh, as I kind of expected. That's why I usually do things in the afternoon, but nonetheless, let's start talking about a couple things. And one of them is going to be security. This is a, uh, topic I want to dive a lot more into as always one there's just going to be a lot more security things to talk about we just dealt with our we're kind of dealing with really delegated uh, there's a customer a client if you will someone who's just booked some consulting not one we manage but there's always a lot of things when they go wrong there's a lot to talk about because it's not at all about talking about the company. It's about all the processes they had, what processes worked, what processes failed, how they could have done better, because bringing forth a lot of that insight is how we help people prevent this from happening in the future. And uh, that's a really big topic. Me and Jason were kind of rolling around and definitely want to dive into just some of the overall lessons learned on things. And I'm going to share this thread right here over on Reddit so people can read along with me. This is kind of related to it. And I'm going to jump to the part here. I love that Huntress did this. They did a nice threat report for what they see. Small and medium-sized businesses. And there's a lot of details in here, but let's just jump to some of the stuff in here that I think is really interesting because I've seen so many changes and one the discussion at Reddit post is great because once again, Huntress very much engages the community on things, but the summary of all the different attacks that they've seen, this is just really interesting because a big right here, this is the part that people, this is a result of better security, but this is just where the threat actors are pivoting to a decreased reliance on custom tools and especially malicious binaries and intrusions uh, until final action, such as a ransomware deployment. As a result, many classic mechanisms for identifying and emitting threats, such as pure antivirus solutions, are less effective for countering intrusions. And what they're doing here, there's a couple of factors. One's called LAL bins. I love that it's called LAL bins, live off the land. And this is because there's so many tools available in PowerShell and everything else that you can build quite a bit of tooling with the existing binaries that exist to figure out how to attack an adversary. So these threat actors get in here and they're like, Hey, I'm going to not going to run some weird software, download some weird software that'll get caught. I'm going to use the currently available tool sets. This is why tools like seam are becoming so important. Anything that can monitor for changes and go, Hey, that's unusual. This person in this particular department doesn't usually run PowerShell in this way or these commands. And then that leads people to understanding security better. This is just a really nice in-depth report kind of showing, and we work with Huntress, so we're aware of a lot of these things. Huntress did a nice summary of them, but these are discussions I have with the Huntress team because uh, I you know, probably engage with them maybe once every week or two, uh, you know, just discussing with people there. I, I end up knowing a lot of the different hackers uh, that work there. And uh, there's some really smart, smart people there that keep an eye on this. Uh, tool usage intrusion, scripting your object, non-malware, 29%. One of them in here, though, is the RMM tools. There's a summary of this right here. Observed RMM tools. This is, uh, this is the challenge. And I've run into this a few times myself. ConnectWise is getting better at this, but hey, the success of the product is a big reason. The screen connect being used as an initial attack vector. 
there's a couple different factors in this. Sometimes it's one of those things that you run into where someone gets a hold of the IT persons, the MSP, their Screen Connect session to take over the client. That does happen sometimes. But a really common thing is people spinning up or specifically those people are threat actors setting up instances of these commonly used remote tools that you'll find out on the internet. They go, hey, look, this is a popular tool and it's not gonna be flagged by any type of AV system because it's a legit tool. It's not the tool that's the problem. It's once they get someone to install the remote access tool, then they use that tool to pivot and do the things that they wanna do because it runs at a high privilege level. So this is it, it's just breaking down things that we really know. And Kyle talked about this at the IT Nation. We talked about this in our talk. We're gonna do an updated talk of how I would hack you. Identity focused security. What they're doing so often when they get on these isn't always ransomware, but a lot of times looking for business email compromise. It is amazing how much of it's this. And I know they have a chart in here for this. Suspicious inbox rules are 47% of what happens. So they get on the system. You have two factor. You've got all the things done right with your Office 365 or even G Suite account. So whatever your cloud account is instantly. The moment they're on the system, they grab your session tokens because they can't bypass the 2FA. They can't bypass all the security you put around the login. But if they get on your system that is logged in, they steal your session tokens. And the next step from there, because session tokens, if you've done conditional access policies right, they expire. So you're constantly having to re-log into things. But... So they don't have to re-log in. They start modifying your rules almost immediately. So even if you find out a threat actor was on your system and you get them off and you didn't get ransomware, you don't know that all the problems are solved because you have to understand whether or not they stole those session tokens and have made a mess of your email. And this is absolutely like something you just have to watch because this suspicious inbox rules, yep, that's what basically happens immediately. Uh, they start forwarding your email somewhere else because by forwarding your email to where they want it to be forwarded to, and especially if they're leaving a copy for you so you didn't even know it happened, so you're still getting your emails, they have rules getting your emails, they start doing password resets via email, and maybe they create a filter that stops password resets from getting to your email, but it does forward those to them. There's different rules that they may follow to get into your system. But um, go through, read through this report, give you an idea of what the threat landscape looks like. I just thought it was great that they put this out, that there's also no paywall. There's no um, advertising here. You can just read all of this data. This is great. This is... Um, I love companies that take the time to publish a lot of this out there. Oh, and the good news is Quackpots are going down. Uh, this has been a malware. It's been around for a long time. So there, there's some positive news in here, but man, post-intrusion access tools observed. This is the trend now. We're seeing less Cobalt Strike and more of these RMM tools. So yes. <laughs> Default ports, any benefit in changing them? You know, very, very little. You you may get a reduction in noise because if I had port 22 open to the public internet, there's going to be just a lot of things that look for it. But if you look at the modern tool sets that are out there, Shodan's an easy example. Shodan doesn't care what port you put things on. You can put it on a port and it'll identify the port that it's on. So if you find that whatever thing you have publicly exposed is already exposed in Shodan, People then use Shodan to start figuring out, and there's other tools besides Shodan, but Shodan will start making it easy to figure those things out, going, oh, look, uh, they've moved SSH or some other service to this other port, and it'll still identify the service. But you do get some reduced noise because there's out there plenty of tools just scanning for port 22 um, or whatever common ports are out there. Good morning from Germany. Awesome. The land down under, awesome. All the way to Australia, I'm assuming. Welcome to your first stream. Yeah, doing it in the morning, I'm probably going to get some different people in here. Because it is, I get a lot of people in the afternoon um, when I do it, but that's going to be a lot more U.S. I don't think because I'm on the Eastern Standard Time, uh, as many people are awake this early. But imagine European people are like, hey, it's not late at night for me. <laughs> Oh, let's see here. 
what was the other thing? I didn't have a ton of things to bring up today because I was going to keep it rather short because uh, to get on with some of the family things. Feel free to throw any questions you have at me. Hello from Norway, Netherlands. Absolutely. Oh, this was uh, the True Nass. I got to find the bookmark for it. Yeah, the True Nass is bothering me a bit by this. I don't know what the solution is, but I posted this the other day. I, it's funny because usually if I make a video, I know people from True Nass. I tag them in my uh, Twitter posts about the video, so I know they see them. But no one's really addressed this issue in True Nass yet. It's Europe, Euro, Euro prime time. Yes. Maybe I should do some morning ones, call them my European <laughs> live streams. <laughs> and it's late night in Australia, so... Lunchtime in the UK, Turkey Day, absolutely. But this right here, uh, MinIO. So it's already been deprecated from the latest version of TrueNAS Scale, and they turned it into an app. But then it's also now been announced it'll be missing from the next update. So 13.1 of TrueNAS Core will also get rid of MinIO. Now, it's good reason they're getting rid of it. It's got some security problems, but it's just kind of annoying that they haven't really addressed the certificate issue in it. And you're like telling people to use it. You're putting the option for security certificates, but not working or testing it properly. And, you know, I posted in the forums and I've got dead air. I got one other person just says, I have the same problem. And I'm like, okay. Oh, and now a third person just thumbs upping it. So that's the latest alert on this is a third person give me a thumbs up on this problem. These are some of the annoyances I still have. Like, I don't know. I I don't rely much on any of the S3 stuff, but if I know a lot of people do, we've helped enough clients with it. And my solution has just been to run it in a Linux system and set up MinIO because it's not that hard to set up and then point it back at the storage server. It's kind of a pain compared to you'd think your NAS having something integrated like this would just be an easier way to do it. But this has not been something they've been able to really uh, sort out. I had servers on the open internet used to do fine by running SSH and alternate ports starting a few years ago. There have been lots of brute force password guessing on the alternate port. Yeah, it as people start changing ports, things just move. Same thing like people who move RDP on separate ports. This happens a lot. You obviously find tons of them on 3389 looking at Shodan, but uh, yeah, there's lots of RDP not on those ports anymore. It's on other ports. Uh, let me find out here. Shodan. Oh, this is fun. We'll grab, I'm going to share this tab here. Uh, this one said it had RDP. Let's find out. Oh, this one's on 3389. <laughs> Let's find ones that aren't on 3389. Uh, 3388, for example. Hey, look, these people changed theirs to 3388. <laughs> so it really doesn't matter, you know, moving a port. It's still, it, the its response is RDP. It's kind of as simple as that, which, which doesn't bode well for people because then now it's exposed and then flaws in RDP are a problem. <laughs> Have you any issues with PFSense 2.7 upgrade systems and it corrupted both to the point where they can't boot? So far, none of them have caused a problem. Um, I The thing I tell people to do is before they update, reboot your system. Because if the system has a problem that keeps it from rebooting and then you also loaded an update, the problem still existed and the update didn't fix the problem. This is one of the just processes. Reboot it once before you update. Then you know if it doesn't come back, there was going to be a problem. So this is where these systems have really long uptimes. Matter of fact, most of the uptime is going to be probably since the last update. And if something goes wrong and something runs out of space, but maybe the box just keeps on working because the services haven't crashed, but they won't start back up on the next time, this is why a reboot is important.
Ooh, they, yeah, I've seen, um, it's been on my to-do list to test. I got to get back to that, uh, testing crowd sec with PF sense. Let me look that up. It's not an official one is the one thing that drives me nuts, but I do like crowd sec. Let me find the uh there we go there is an article i'll throw here this is right in the netgate forums i'll see Testing for PR, da, 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 is there anything? CrowdSec finally coming. Is there any updates a day ago? Actually, let's look further. Is it in there now? That would be interesting. So I got so busy, I never really had time to test it on there. Systems, and we'll go to the packages. Available. Yeah, I don't see it in the available packages yet, so I don't think it's officially there. So definitely uh, looking forward to it being official, though. Uh, nobody has mentioned anything about removing OpenVPN and Cobia. Can't find an app for this. I don't know why you'd want OpenVPN in your uh, NAS. I've never thought to do that. And I don't think VPN inside. The problem is you, you need updates more frequently than I think the app can be updated or is updated is probably a better way to put that. But the um, change over next CE. All right. Let me find this real quick. Let's actually pull this up. The better solution, I think, if you need VPN, tail scale is definitely one of those options. So what VPN options are in here? Yeah, the current VPN options are uh, WG Easy, tail scale, and zero tier. So you can still use WireGuard in here, but... I don't, I don't really have a use case where I'd really, I don't really use a VPN inside of my NAS. This is why none of these are installed. I usually think VPN is something I use on my firewall. That way the firewall can manage one VPN connection. Cause usually not one thing I want to talk to it's several, but they do have wire guard and tail scale and zero tier. So you do have options in here. Will be a plugin as far as I know, but the open sense, which has had crowd six plugin for a while. So cool. Good to know that they're in there. Uh, are you in the XCPNG Discord, by the way? Yes, but I'm bad at... I get so many notifications in Discord, it's hard for me to manage. So, yes, I'm in there. Let me look. Yep, definitely in there. I go to their forums every day. If you want to actually talk to me or the team, I should say, the forums is where I spend all my time. I just don't think Discord's useful for uh, figuring things out. I think it's actually terrible at it. Real-time chat requires me to be real-time engaged. And by the time someone says, oh, didn't you see my post in Discord? And if it's been two days, it's a mess. Versus if I'm here in XCPNG, I can go to my notices and read the things I was tagged in so I can reply and have a very concise, searchable, indexed reply. I think Discord forums suck. Um, I don't think they're great at all. Got notified by email from CrowdSec that they had it. Okay. I'm sure they're going to have it soon. I know I have some links that from CrowdSec about testing it. Have an offsite NAS uh, pulling backups. Yeah, WireGuard is probably going to... WireGuard or TailScale is going to be your best uh, way to do that. So... Yeah, if you don't... If, if the remote location doesn't have a firewall that you can load a VPN... Go with WireGuard or TailScale because, yeah, it looks like they did get rid of um, OpenVPN. My guess is they didn't want to maintain the security of it. 
they're pushing more things to apps because you don't want to have to do an entire OS upgrade every time there's an app change. And that is where the challenges come in. So they're separating. And this is just pretty good common sense from the people over at IX Systems for both versions of TrueNAS separating out OS updates versus the updates for the apps. So the more things they can push into an app is going to be easier for them to maintain. Because matter of fact, they're not necessarily the ones maintaining it. They're just pulling it uh, from Docker and then pulling it into uh, the app. Um, This probably leads me to a really good article I read today. Well, I don't know about good, but it was someone going on about just how challenging maintaining open source is. Everyone wants their free apps. No one wants to pay for them. And this is the challenge at open source right now. Trying to find developers for things is hard. And it's hard to say if the open source ecosystem is really shrinking. But, you know, I had this whole rant I did two weeks ago on our home lab show about firewalls and all the open source firewalls are just gone. They just can't find project maintainers for these because the reality is it takes a lot of skill to keep these up to date and developed. And if you don't have a good business model to support it, it's really hard to maintain it. Same thing why there's probably not an open VPN server app. My guess is no one wanted to maintain it. So they narrow down what they want to maintain. This is actually the challenge. IX Systems does have a funding model around TrueNAS. They sell, IX Systems sells hardware that has TrueNAS on it. That's their business model. And then they take that and give you TrueNAS, but they have to decide what is or isn't going in TrueNAS based on how much time they can allot to developers. It's like any other business. We'd love to give you this software for free, but we can only put so many features in it because I can only hire so many developers to maintain those features. So if those features start falling off and I have to make a decision, do we add more developers to fix the VPN problem that's used by very few and certainly not used in the enterprise market? Or do we focus on the updated D-RAID and updated ZFS features? These are how those balances, um, that it's it's just the balances that are kept for things. And it's, un, it's one of those things, like a lot of these open source projects, especially when they have a corporate sponsor, are going to lean towards the features more so that the corporate world uses. And it kind of leaves a lot of the other people like the person here needing the VPN uh, kind of at a loss because I think that was pretty much like I work mostly with, I don't, I build a lot of home lab stuff myself. I interact with the home lab community a lot, but obviously my job, what funds me and why I have so few ads on this whole YouTube channel is the fact that I have a commercial company where we do enterprise level consulting and I have zero times ever set up a VPN on a NAS for any of our business clients. And true NAS and IX systems knows that there's not this high demand for it. So my guess is that's why they dropped it, which is unfortunate, but um, it, until we can find someone. Yeah. And the developers need to eat. Yes. I wish to use single PC as hypervisor. How do I access web interface CLI? Is it possible? Uh, XCPNG has XO Lite, um, but XO Lite is very beta, maybe alpha right now. So XO Lite gives you very limited control over things. It keeps getting better. Um, it's hopefully going to be pretty good by next year. But if you want to access it, you can either A, SSH in, or B, you, you need to use Zen Orchestra. Zen Orchestra is the ideal way to manage XCPNG. I got BS from a guy in Red Stating. I pay yearly for a few services. They run servers, therefore you should pay them. I pay yearly. Oh, yeah, there's, I don't know. I, someone was arguing with me on Twitter, which I thought was stupid. I, they had the dumbest argument. And I just told I'm not going to engage with them anymore. I, told, I gave them my two cents and I'm not going to keep engaging. They were complaining about net data charging for their cloud service. So net data is a business that gives away their monitoring software for free and open source. That's wonderful. If you would like to sign up for their cloud service to get all the data aggregated in the cloud and have different analytics processed on it and have notifications sent from the cloud service. They charge for it. And someone was angry that they charge for it because apparently if you do something open source, apparently you have to host it for free for people uh, it, as well. So I don't get it. <laughs> Thanks for your stream. I learned a lot over the years. I, you inspired me to get out of my comfort zone and try new things. Bought a PFS recently. I love it. Thanks again. That is awesome. 
Uh, I love when I hear people diving more into tech, taking control over it. I think self-hosted is still extremely important. Too many things are just as a service and it doesn't give you as much control over your data. And it drives me crazy because I don't mind paying for, you know, my years ago self. I would, especially with, yeah, I think about Black Friday coming up. I used to buy lots of DVDs. I wanted to own the movies and I was like, cool, the movies I want to watch are on sale and I can watch them anytime because I own the media. I have no problem paying for the creation of it. Like, I don't think there's any problem that I bought a DVD of a movie or Blu-ray or whatever, and I own the media. I can watch it anytime. I have now supported the people who created the movie and that ecosystem. And I think that's great. Same thing with music. Now everything's like, oh, we're just going to never actually give you the media. You're going to pay for the right to use it in some way, maybe through an extrapolation through Spotify or some music service subscription. But the moment, the moment you stop the subscription, so does all of your access to that media. And I think that's something people are getting a little aggravated about because companies try to sway you to use their particular service by simply signing an exclusive deal with your favorite artist. Now your favorite artist is no longer on the service you're currently subscribed to. And now you have to make a decision. Well, some of the artists have signed with this one. Some of the artists have signed with this one. Which subscription service do I have? And this has come back to the home lab where people go, no, I don't mind buying and downloading it. This is why I'm a big fan of like Corey Doctorow. I buy all of his books. I support it the last few on Kickstarter. And I get to have a absolute copy of them to put into my library. And I think that's wonderful. Happy Thanksgiving from New York. Happy Thanksgiving from uh, Illinois. Awesome. Thanks from the UK uh, for the recent scale video. It seems you really come on. They really come on in the last few months. I really give them uh, another go. Open source Google Photos alternative. Yeah, I'm still using Synology for my photo stuff as an alternative to Google Photos because I get to maintain it myself. But I know that's not open source and it does require you to own a Synology. I'm looking at the other options. Anytime I've tested them, they usually disappoint me in terms of not being as feature complete. But I, it's been a little bit since I test. Open source doesn't equal free. Correct. Yeah, TailScale is awesome. I did a video on TailScale uh, using it with TrueNAS scale. I, I think it's great. Like, that's just an awesome, solid solution. Greetings from Australia. Did you ever test power consumption of a server with different hypervisors? Tested um, and scale. Oh, okay. Uh, that's a challenge to really get that as a good number because it probably depends on the hypervisor itself and how you configure it and what services you're running in that hypervisor. So that, I don't know, that's an interesting test. Maybe I want to dive into, I have a handful of systems and I'm working on like a budget home lab build video, but it is interesting to think about the, I, I love all these little devices they have Low power consumption. Patrick from Serve the Home has reviewed this. This is on my desk because I need to review it. If I have it on my desk and I keep staring at it, I know I'll get it reviewed. But yeah, uh, power consumption comes up a lot. And testing the power consumption between different hypervisors, interesting. I might try it. But it comes down to what features you're using. And I bring it up like that because if you compared XCP and G to Proxmox, you'd probably find Proxmox is going to use more power if you start loading all the extra services on Proxmox that may not exist on XCP and G. So you have to create a baseline of, well, I'm going to use XCP and G, but it doesn't have, for example, a built-in Ceph system. But if you load Ceph and you start replicating it to something else, well, that's going to use a lot more power because it's more compute to be able to calculate that. If you're running ZFS, well, ZFS is still a software managed trade, which does have some CPU cycle counts on there. And uh, there's, it, it's a lot of those little things that make it hard to really test. It comes down to what people's use case are. Now we're a question. Short run cable less than 30 feet, PoE plus CC, uh, Good, always useful, always useful copper. 
I know it's expensive wherever you might be, but I, I will admit the CCA stuff. I'm a lot of people have told me about bad experiences with it. I, I don't trust it. So I would definitely avoid it. This was a great article. Um, I I'm going to pull this up because this is something I think is absolutely I, I might probably do a dedicated video because signals added so many features. But yeah, their operating costs are around 50 million in 2025 free is sustainable long term without backers, many small subscriptions. Signal is the world's most widely used private messaging app and our cryptographic technologies have provided actually privacy beyond signal app itself since launching in 2013. I've been using this for. I think I started using it in 2015 or 2016. I've been using this for years. And they are absolutely like none other. It's just an amazing thing. But this is the, the really big part. Everyone wants their free thing. But this is what it costs to run Signal. The... $1.3 million per year for storage. $2.9 million a year... Uh, for servers, six million dollars per year in registration fees. Bandwidth is two point eight million, and additional services are seven hundred thousand dollars per year. Uh, the cost of store storing nothing and serving everyone, yeah, that's it's a lot. So. Just like everything else, the signal message and files are always unencrypted. When you send a message, signal temporarily queues that message for delivery. As soon as your message is delivered, that small bundle of encrypted data, your message can be dropped from the queue. The storage of unencrypted files is temporary, and undelivered and unencrypted data is automatically purged after a period of inactivity. Even though everything is only temporary, this storage still costs $1.3 million per year. Yes, it is. I, I, let me just drop this article in here. I, I recommend everyone read it so they understand what it costs to host things at scale. Uh, Synology got a great product and their prize is their NAS is cheap versus what you can do with the NAS, yes. Building my first home lab, building uh, 10 plus years of your videos. An XCB really helps. Uh, I stepped stepped using stopped using Zen back around 2007. Wow, it's come a long way since then, yes. It's early, so I'm reading slow. <laughs> I really liked your demo Synology management. I just loathe to get one. I'm a true NAS all in. And thanks to you, I moved away from non-RAID storage of data. Yes, absolutely. Uh, thoughts on a framework laptops for primary workstation office environment? I have heard lots of good things about them, but my boss is a bit weary since they only have a one-year warranty. I haven't heard anything bad. I, I've heard nothing but good about framework, but I have not had enough hands-on experience with them to really tell you much about it. I, Generally speaking, I don't think a year warranty is bad, but you know, for some convenience reasons, even we buy some of the Lenovo laptops with longer warranties. That way, if a customer has a problem, we're not dealing with it. So that does come down to the business situation of things. But I don't think Framework makes a bad product from anything I've read so far. I think I have only one or two friends that have it. And I have enough tech people I follow that have used it that really sing its praises. So I'm not aware of anything bad specifically about the Framework, but do have to dive into that a little more. Running your own media will cost around $300 just in power per year. Um, uh, Six million registration fees. Yeah, what are those? I'm assuming. Well, they have it all broke down in detail. Signal incurs expenses when people download Signal, sign up for an account, or when they re-register a device. We use third-party services to send a registration code via SMS. Or voice call to verify the person in position of given phone number and actually intend to sign up for a Signal account. So, yes, this is the cost of not letting all the spammers uh, take over your system. The, the, the love-hate people have with Signal I love Signal because it uses phone numbers. The number of people that are angry that it uses phone numbers, and I know they're working on an alternative identity, but like, for example, I have lots of communications with my staff that I need to be secure. How do I know 
instantly that it's my staff. Well, I have them into my cell phone. So when I link them up a signal, unless they change, and yes, they have done this, I'll see a safety notice change if they get a different phone. So now I can actually find out that, hey, did you actually get a new phone? I may talk to them, but I'm always clearly identifying who they are with signal and that's not easily hijacked. So yeah. Yeah, I think it'd be worthwhile as well to do a full dive on this a lot. Uh, yes, Synology does have an all-flash NAS device. I do you have a video on SureNAS scale permission settings and how to set them. I find ACL computing. Yes, I do. <clears throat> you can... Lawrence.video... Uh, Lawrence I'm going to throw this here. This is my entire TrueNAS playlist. I've made everything pretty simple. Uh, it's lawrence.video slash TrueNAS, and that will get you to all the different TrueNAS systems. Um, but I've got a whole video diving into the ACL thing, because, yes, it can be confusing. One of your videos, you show more than 60 sites in Unified Controller. We have 23 sites in our cloud controllers uh, with 700 devices, and the devices page is lagging. Um, something of note is this. So the device page may be lagging, but it depends on how fast of a system you have. And... The system I'm running on is quite fast that it comes down to speed. This is a uh, Ryzen 9 9500 X that's running our Unify controller. So I, are you running it on something that has a that level of speed equivalency? That's the question. How fast is the drive access? Um, so it's to, to get it to be fast, it comes down to how performant is the system. Do you have additional performance? Uh, the supplier recommends splitting across two servers. Yeah, and sometimes that's the solution. Once you, it, it kind of depends on the number of devices. Uh, we have a couple clients that they have like a thousand. Uh, one of them, I think, has 6,000 people <laughs> so that are accessing the Wi-Fi across like 300 plus devices. That's on its own controller. Um, and it's, the controller is located inside that particular. It's a co-managed IT. So that controller is managed by them on-prem. Is there a better way around or a better way than using a VPN? Uh, a better way than what? I've got a video about using TailScale as your VPN, so I think that's definitely a good idea. Um, that. So I, I maybe need more context for that question to answer it. I've got signal and session, no phone number needed, but session is a a pain in the butt, especially with non-techies. And that's the whole thing. The number of people, I have so many people in my contact, especially non-technical people, all using Signal. That's one of the things about Signal. They've made it so easy to use the non-technical people because if it, if it was just up to technical people, we could just use PGP for everything, right? But then that makes it harder for more average people for communications. If we signed everything with our PGP keys, there's some challenges with that. But if we, you know, use Signal, well, it's just a lot easier. You don't have to be that technical to sign up for Signal and have privacy. So, yeah, that's probably a good video that I dive into that as a topic. Server electric costs. My always-on server, 30 watt, 24 hours by 3CI, 260 watt, $9 in UK, total gas electric per year. Yeah, it adds up. It adds up. We're lucky that we have a lot of less expensive power here. So you're... See, uh, what is your... I guess it kind of depends. The Signal use RCS. N Signal's not a text messaging app. That's I'm assuming you're talking about the uh, SMS RCS signal uses in the internet 
to relay things across signal servers, but encrypts each device end to end. So it's not using it. They, this is a controversial thing because they removed the ability for it to be your text messenger. I never used it as that. I never liked it as that. I always liked it to be separate. So I uh, need to have a solar panel battery that will help lessen electric expenses. Yeah. Yeah. My power bill gets to be a lot here and it's a lot more at the office just from all the servers. I try to spin everything down as much as possible when I'm not using stuff in my lab. I always look at what can I turn off? What can I have less of in my lab to make things go? This is one of the reasons, even though I, I, I have the money, I can afford a bigger power bill. I just don't see the point in it. So I still think a lot about energy efficiency, but this is one of the reasons that I have this particular box running still is this little Intel Atom CPU is very low powered. It's an Atom C338 at 1.5 gigahertz. Look at our two threads we got going here. And uh, yeah, it's not going to be very fast, but it's really power efficient. And it just is so I can have an extra backup of things. So I'm always thinking about what can I turn off um, constantly as I sit here with all these lights on for a studio. But even these, I make sure all of these are set at a more minimal power. And I, I don't know, I try to be efficient as I can, but yes. Uh, signal uptake in the UK is still very low. I try to spread the words to clients. Um, construction, I do spread the word as much as possible. Probably 10% of the clients are aware I have it. Yeah. Yep. Um, 24 seven, uh, NAS and you can use sleep functions. Yeah. That's an option as well. I haven't really gone that far because there's certain things like I could, and maybe, a, I don't know if it's a good experiment or not. Cause I don't like the idea of putting the hard drives to sleep because with spinning drives, spinning them up is a higher wattage event. So if I run and I do run backups a couple times a day to mirror my NASs, I could power it down, but I don't think the power savings versus the surge of getting it back up to speed and the wear and tear in the drives may make that worth it. Uh, so that becomes its own challenge. Now, if it's SSDs, yeah, that's that's different. Yeah, that's one of the reasons even like my home assistant is running on, let me pull it up. I still have this running on just a Raspberry Pi 4 because that way, one, I can shut other things down as needed. And I still like the home assistant, especially because it's how I run things to, you know, look at the cameras real quick at a glance, change the settings of the lights, automate the settings of the lights, make sure I didn't leave anything on in my studio so I can power off my studio right here. I can make sure my space heater, I can turn it on or off right here because uh, it's rather cool in my basement. But I don't want to heat my whole basement. I only heat the part I'm using, which is my studio. So, yeah, it's always think about I think about a lot of the stuff probably more than I need to. I don't know. I think it's a good exercise. Good morning and hope you have plenty of room for the jerkies. Yes, I do. And thank you. Long time Larker, first time comment. Uh, I work for a very small MSP. My boss wants me to set up an Azure hybrid set up for an existing client. I've only un, only have only to have the on-prem server be decommissioned. Yeah, that's going to happen. Still wondering how you got your camera feeds into HA. Um, yeah, I keep saying I need to do a video on that, but I don't think there's anything special about it. Uh, you just pointed at the Synology. There's a, if you look, I mean, I'm using it as a Synology, but where is, you just, I'll tell, you got to tell Home Assistant, um, I'd have to look up the instructions to walk you through it because I've had these set up for such a long time. But you tell the, you do the Synology connection and from there, let me pull up my Synology real quick as well. But I've allowed Home Assistant to talk to the Synology. Matter of fact, because this Synology is on its own separate network, I had to do some firewall rules for this. But by allowing it to talk to the cameras, you set up the 
interactiveness, it makes it pretty easy to do. And then you can take that data from the Synology. Matter of fact, the connection of Synology is both ways. Surveillance station in home mode. I can hit this button right here and actually change the settings on my surveillance station from home to away mode. So I can do this. And of course, I also have home assistant accessed on my phone. So this makes it really easy for me to make any of these changes, even when I'm remote or glance at my home assistant and see the camera feeds at the same time. I even have like a separate dashboard that's got less things on it for my wife. This is what she sees. She can just look to say, oh, look, a package on the porch or someone in the driveway. I need to do a home assistant video for how I have things done because you can, you can also feed the Synology event data into home assistant and then create triggers based on that with webhooks. Uh, you might want to consider quartz here for your basement. I have one on my desk, just keeps my hands warm. I did heat. Yeah. Um, I've looked at different ones and there's not a massive difference in them. So the one I have is actually a, I don't know what to describe it. The radiator type. Uh, the reason for a radiator type one, it's quiet. It doesn't make any noise. So it can be on while I'm recording and there's no chance of noise. But I know the quartz ones are pretty popular too. The Blink cameras, the cheap ones work with Home Assistant. I don't like all the cloud-enabled cameras. That's one of the reasons I'm, I like this analogy so much is because I, I can run all my cameras not cloud-enabled. I can run them all locally, not have any type of cloud thing going on or my data going to a cloud or anywhere I don't want it to go. So my, even though they're only looking outside, I don't want them potentially accessible because I, I have a lack of faith in many of these cloud companies. Well, one, I do have faith that they'll charge me a subscription. I don't have the best faith that they have the best security on these things. So being able to uh, not have someone else see what's in my backyard as I show my backyard on YouTube, but I have chose to show my backyard on YouTube. <laughs> I am, I am not, you know, arbitrarily being chosen by others for what you want to see on these. Do you run services in separate virtual machines, for example? One for Nextcloud, one for Unify Controller, or do you run in one virtual machine, then in Docker? Kind of depends on what my risk is. So I don't really like things all in one, but sometimes it's a bunch of services for me that I'm less worried about. Maybe I'll run them all in one, but you got to kind of think about how would they escape to each other? How do you want to lock them down from each other to prevent any type of potential issues? So it's more efficient to run everything in one Docker, one virtual machine with a bunch of things running in Docker. That's going to give you the greatest level of efficiency, but not necessarily the best levels of security. So that kind of comes down to your use case. Certain critical infrastructure things like Unify, I don't run Unify in Docker. It runs as an independent VM. There's no official Docker support for Unify. I don't use Nextcloud. Maybe in the future I will, but I'm... I would probably run Nextcloud, you know, if I did it in Docker, that if I was using it to you to manage critical documents, I might want to keep that separate. But there's a lot of little random services maybe you don't want necessarily uh, kept separate that you can consolidate into one. It's always kind of playing out the risks. Hi, Tom, interested in AirPlay and similar. Is there anything your clients and networks optimize it? I don't know how I would optimize AirPlay. I guess I don't understand that as a question. I don't use AirPlay, so. Uh, Reolink are fantastic cameras. I don't know. I've had more problems with Reolink. Uh, Amcrest seems better, but yeah. I'm curious on cameras. How would you set up cameras without Unify or Synology? Uh, I don't know. I mean... There's NVR software out there. Some people like Blue Iris, but I don't like the fact that it runs on Windows. So I'm not a big fan of Blue Iris. Um, I don't know any good open source NVR software. There's nothing out there that I would say is good. There's stuff out there, but it's not near as feature complete as the Unify, Synology, or any of the other commercial platforms out there. Home Assistant walkthrough. Yeah. Uh, totally agree on a cloud-based uh, video void. I just supply them to less technically literate people with a low budget. Unify G3s, I'm happy with. Uh, not the best video quality. Yeah. A 
Frigate's nice, but I don't know that Frigate, I would say, is feature complete. Like, it's a good tool, but if you started lining up Frigate against some of the commercial ones, you'd probably find it doesn't line up quite as well. Not that I'm saying Frigate's bad or you shouldn't use it. It's just one of those challenges. Uh, Shinobi is the other one I was going to bring up. I always forget the name of it. Um, I, always have the, I have it bookmarked. I go through my little NVRs I have bookmarked, and Shinobi is another one. It, it's not. It's just not feature complete. It's that's the big, big. I'm trying to figure out the best way to say it other than that. Like it just doesn't have as many features or the polish you're going to get from the Unify or Synology solutions. Best way I can describe like how I feel about it. <laughs> uh, let's see here. Let me look at the, did my wife get food? I was looking at the cameras again real quick. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, Motion Eye, talking like our earlier. Let me uh, stop sharing that tab. Where is the link to this? So I can share it back out. So right here, you notice it hasn't been updated in a number of years. And this is the problem with open source project. Uh, Motionize the Linux distribution that turns your single board computer into a video surveillance system. Due to personal reasons, I can no longer actively involve in this project. If anyone's interested to take it over, please contact me. Three years, no one took it over. Wait, updated readme. Nope, someone just, yeah, that's all. They updated the readme. This is the problem. Like everyone wants the free software, but no one wants to develop the free software. Um, so it kind of becomes a challenge. I don't know. That's what happened to Motion Eye, if anyone's wondering. <laughs> Any idea why major companies like Walmart or the government are using for outdoor surveillance cameras? Um, one of the big players in the market is going to be Axis. And I mean, so we do consulting on cameras a lot. And I like when people start out with, oh, man, I can't go with one of those Chinese cameras. I need an American based company. And then we show them the price and they go, all right, I'm going to go with the Amcrest. I'm going to go with something else. And it is a challenge because if you look at how much the Axis cameras are, they're about eight times more expensive than their counterparts. They're not like just double the price. They're substantially more. Now, Unify is not bad. I don't think there's any restrictions on the Unify ones that I know of. And the ones from Synology, the, they don't have a big variety, but the surveillance cameras from Synology are now certified. Uh, so you can use them at some of the big places. So Unify is getting bigger into that game. If you ever considered uh, Apple Silicon, there's a few projects to run Linux natively on M1. I'm personally considering this for my instance. Um, uh, I hate, I hate how much I like this stupid MacBook. I'm not ready yet to put Linux on there until it gets more feature complete. But this laptop works really, really well. Uh, this is a Mac M1, the Air. Oh, I mean, to me, it's just a terminal. All it really is is a browser terminal and an SSH. I SSH to my jump box that's in Linux and I get things done. So it doesn't like I'm really using the Mac OS on it and replying to emails 99% of the time on it. But I will admit the M1 silicone, awesome. I really hope, I would love to load Linux on this. I would love a feature complete Linux on there that was as good as the Mac OS runs on it because the battery life is ridiculous on it. Like I'm in, Super impressed with just how long the battery lasts on that thing, which is exactly what I want. A nice passively cooled terminal that I can sit on my couch with for four hours if I want to hacking away at something. So, yeah. What about scripted? Once again, you can cobble together some features, but it's not the same as a feature complete MVR. So it's not that these things don't exist, or as someone said right here, Frigate is not very newbie friendly. Probably true. Agent DVR. I don't think there's anyone 
um, there's the, the problem is there's not any drive to really put together an open source MVR. It takes a lot of money to hire a good developer team to manage an MVR project. How is that going to get funded? This is why there's not any really great open source ones out there because no one's found a good funding model around it. I, I've talked about, I kind of gave up on this. I was going to build, and I still want to, but I don't know, even with all the, you know, people I have that follow me that work in the tech space, I wanted to build a better open source document management system for managing IT documents. But man, getting that funded, learning how much it would cost to build for one, and then figuring out how to pay for it all. Uh, I, I had people talk about some of the ambitious things I had to do. And I talked to a few people that are pretty realistic and said, yeah, I mean, you, you're going to have to start with about two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars $300,000 and then figure out how to maintain it from there. And it's like, okay, I can come up with that money, but I, at some point I need a return on that money because I can't just leave a giant hole in my retirement fund of, I, I cashed it out to do this thing that has no way to make any of the money back. This is the challenge with some of these open source ones. So who's going to put together, if it takes, you know, three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars to really build a good NVR system with a good team of developers that are experienced, then how do we reap the money for it? That's a challenge. And this is why there's not a lot of uh, ones out there, especially because usually someone's going to want an open source one to support all the cameras. So a camera company may not want to do it because if the camera company were to build the NVR, they're going to want it to exclusively work with their cameras. The hardware companies, Synology, that's kind of what they do. You can only get Synology surveillance station on a Synology device. So they've invested a lot of money in building their surveillance software because you have to buy their device for it. So they have a funding model for it. But yeah, this is a whole uh, challenge around it. <laughs> yes, uh, I, I don't know how you say it. I see uh, ASAHI is the Apple ARM Linux. I believe that sounds right. Um, but yeah, I use my MacBook M1 to code in Xcode and it's slow. I need... Uh, I, and I need earplugs to code. I do all my stuff in Vim in uh, a tool called, I do my text documents in a tool called Zettler, but the, I just do everything in Vim, I'm, but I don't really program much. So you're just, if you watch me do anything, it's not going to be wonderful. I'm not a real killer, so a real programmer at that stuff. So I'm not like great at it. I personally wouldn't use Apple Silicon just for Home Assistant. The M1 chips are powerful, but yes, they're small x86 PCs that handle Home Assistant perfectly for one-tenth the cost. Well, and you look at Home Assistant on a Raspberry Pi like I have over here. I mean, my my Raspberry Pi is low wattage, ARM-based, runs Home Assistant perfectly fine. So absolutely, like this is a uh, you know a solid system for doing this. A friend of mine has an M2. Is it bad that I was annoyed by how good it was? Yeah, they've just done such a good job on there. Yeah, two or 300K, the bare minimum for that project. Uh, I might not even be considering having an average senior dev salary. Yeah, this is a real challenge um, when you're building out some of these projects is what a senior developer costs today. You know, I was talking about this with NetGate because there was all the hate with NetGate of the fact that they, um, you know, are charging for the home lab edition. And I granted they should have just charged for it and not changed it and then went back on it. That's definitely a different topic, but the number of people that are kernel kernel developers that are working for NetGate. And if you look at what a kernel developer makes, and I think they have three or four people who are uh, kernel developers, kernel developers make based on salary. And I don't have any friends that are actually the kernel developers, but I have friends that are close. So this kind of lines up their Linux developers. They're making close to $200,000 a year. <laughs> so how do I, um, how do you fund a team of senior developers making almost $200,000 a year to write really good solid code and then give the product away for free? That's yeah. As he. It's still strange to say. <laughs> 
Any final thoughts on PF Sense? No, I have no more thoughts than I had before on it. They miscommunicated. They misstepped. They went back and fixed it. Uh, do you Jay, have any use case for trying out the latest Raspberry Pi? Um, I haven't really because my home assistant runs fine on my Pi 4, so there's not a need to move to a Pi 5. Do you send any logs from Home Assistant to Gray Log or Prometheus? That's a good idea. Currently, I don't. Uh, I didn't have a use case for that, but I never really looked at what logs it would send. So that's how do you send syslog out of Home Assistant to Prometheus? Or I would use Gray Log, but that's interesting. That's where I've heard the word before. Yes, there's a Japanese beer called that. I've had that Japanese beer. I was like, that's a familiar word, but I can't remember where I've heard it before. If Signal's not a text messaging app, do you text? I I text with very, 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 very few people. Um, I text with the couple non-technical people who don't use Signal. And I use the default app that's in my Android phone. So, yeah, I'm not, that's, uh, yeah, I don't really try. I don't care about third-party text messaging apps. I don't text much at all. It's not not much of what I do. All right. You know, I want to look for that other email real quick to circle back on it because I think this is a CrowdSec. Uh, let's pull this up because it's almost here. There we go. This is the CrowdSec for PFSense. We have created a PFSense package with a simple UI to configure security engine, a firewall, mediation, and a bouncer, small, medium, log processor. Nice. So they've submitted the package to the PFSense developers for review. Awesome. So this is, we're getting close. So yes, this is uh, from the CrowdSec blog. I'll throw a link in here on, on that. Let me actually get the link. There we go. So if people want to know, I just want to, I was thinking about that and I'm like, I want to, I want to do a video on that as a topic. So any other final questions? I'm going to wind this down because I got to get going to go do some things and go visit some family. It's been great talking to everyone. I'll, I'll give this uh, five more minutes. So five minute warning, throw in your last questions here. If you're a lurker, just wanting to throw questions, there's 136 people here um, or just say hi, you know, type that in the comments. The uh, things I'm working on, hopefully by the end of the year, is going to be kind of a secure. I want to do a security roundup for some of the things we've seen in uh, 2023. I want to see if Jason's game for talking about this. We have a few assessments we did that were really eye opening with clients, like huh, some security investigations that were also interesting. Morning time. I've been trying to figure out a solution for RDP Linux to Linux. I've been using XRDP and it's okay. I was wondering if there's a private solution like no machine work. Well, I never have the need to. Remotely, I always SSH in Linux systems. I'm not doing anything in the UI remotely with Linux, uh, but X2Go, I've done videos on X2Go. That is another alternative you might want to take a look into. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you very much. Much appreciated. DNS recommendations. I just did a recent video on this. I still choose 9.9.9.9. So 999999. Four, four nines. Quad nine. They're still my favorite DNS. Is there a good unified course that won't break the bank? It's a good question. I need to start working on actually putting a whole course together at some point. Um, may I can find a sponsor for it so it can be free. That might be, um, might be a good idea right there. Because I could definitely teach a whole unified course. Matter of fact, I want to teach one to our internal staff, which I will also try to make externally available. 
What is the best way to present iSCSI Proxbox? Like one block for every VM or different block for every VM? I don't know because I don't use Proxbox. I, I have no, I can't say no. I'm going to have one customer that they're going to maintain their own Proxmox system, but we just don't really do any consulting on Proxmox. So I don't, I, I couldn't tell you like the most optimized way to use it. Would love that sold. You know, that might be, might be a way to fr fund things. Maybe I should look at doing Kickstarter campaigns for projects people want me to do. And if they get funded, I go do that project, like creating a course on Unify and everyone can benefit from it. Um, that way we have a funding model to figure out how to cover the time. Because if I do a deep dive and take the time to do this, that's a lot of time. Uh, that's why there's sometimes I, I haven't had, I, I'm trying to make a lot more time for myself to be able to do these long-term projects, but I still have a lot of things I've been doing in my lab that are also kind of commercial related ventures uh, to fun things. So yeah, that's an interesting thing about um, there. Who is Quad9? Google it. You'll even find videos and interviews on my channel for Quad9. Uh, definitely, I've, I've talked about them a lot. They're a great free DNS service and they're a non, they're, they're a special organization. I believe they're a nonprofit. Um, I do talk to David, but I don't know that. I, I wouldn't do a course through the course system. I think Jay from Learn Linux TV, he tried that. He, me and him, me and Jay talk a lot. And Learn Linux TV, where he publishes all of his courses for free, he's had the best luck with that. He did not have the best luck with creating separate courses to put them on different services. YouTube is the best platform for it. And I still think that's true. Lurker here just wants to say thank you for your videos. I was in IT 10 years and went into uh, SATCOMs back in IT three years ago. Your channel has helped so much. Awesome. Good to hear uh, that you're in there. I don't know if Howard Hughes is your real name or a throwback in reference to actual Howard Hughes. <laughs> Either way, it makes me smile. Glad to hear you're in IT and happy. Yes, Quad9 is in Switzerland now. Uh, how do you get the energy for all your projects? Do you work out a lot? I work out very little. That's one of my problems. I need to work out more. Uh, I I need to exercise more. I at least at a minimum exercise once a week. That is the minimum I do every week. I try to do more, but at least I get one thing in a week. I, do, I go for walks to listen. That's why I listen to all my podcasts is when I go for walks or bicycle riding. But mostly I'm, I'm a workaholic because I can't stop. Uh, when are you going to do another video with Jeff? Hmm. I don't know. I should. I talk to them all the time, so hopefully soon. we got to figure out something we can talk about. Proxmox, one IP per WM. I don't understand. One IP per WM. What does that mean? Well, any course you create will definitely will support it. Awesome. I much appreciate that. What was the lesson learned by my best hypervisor ever, XCPG? Hello from the Netherlands. Awesome. Do you have any plans on creating start to finish plan in PFSense with all the plugins used, say, for a client? We use very few plugins for a client, but yes, I do want to do some new uh, start to finish tutorials in PFSense. That's high on my list of things to do. They, now that both versions are on the latest version of uh, BSD, they're both at feature parity for all the basic functionality. Um, I really want to do that. My getting started with PF sense and a new version of it. That is for sure. How do you feel about WireGuard these days? I'm rather disappointed to find it was rather tedious to set up and running and required a lot of uh, cut and paste, uh, no export for keys. I, I'm fine with that because I know how to do it, but I, I don't have an answer for making it easier. I don't know that there's enough demand to make it easier. Uh, I don't know. So my opinion is I like it, but it's one of those things we do a lot of wire guard setups. We set this up constantly for clients. So we're good at it. And I don't even think about it. Just copy, paste, copy, paste, save, look at connected and hey, let's uh, build some routes. Um, yeah, maybe I'll do some updated tutorials, but I don't have an opinion on I, I It'd be great if the developers made like an export this file, import this file type of setup. But I don't know if they're going to do that or not. I'm having problems with TrueNAS Cobia, Next Cloud over TailScale, TailScale Web BI won't launch. 
could do a video on setting up properly. Ah, that's a different problem. So maybe the problem is the videos get dated because they don't have the best deployment of Nextcloud because if Nextcloud gets installed on TrueNAS, I believe you have to still go to the command line and edit it. And I don't know why they don't just fix that. Um, they don't have it set up properly so you can access it from certain IP addresses. So I, I don't know. Maybe I'll look into that. The problem is the video gets dated quickly because with updates to Nextcloud and changes to TrueNAS, the video becomes irrelevant pretty quick, which I don't know why they don't create better tutorials or just better documentation I can reference on it. That would be wonderful. IBM is among the sponsors for Quad9. That is correct. Uh, I've got a load of resistance bands uh, stuck in a door frame, so I don't have to go exercise. Handy for traveling hotels. Yep. What is your smallest client? I think we have some clients that only have like, I don't know, like five user clients. We still have some small ones out there. Ever thought about creating a GitHub page for your favorite open source project to use? Kind of like awesome uh, home assistant. Uh, maybe, maybe I, I mostly post these things in my forums, so I don't have to use them on GitHub, but I don't have a current forum post on this, but maybe I'll make a forum post on all the apps Tom currently uses. Have you seen DNS stop working from time to time on PFSense? Had issues with that. Um, they've allegedly fixed a lot of that. Uh, if you're having problems, file some bug reports because I haven't seen it on here, but someone asked me that yesterday. So people are having the problems. You just need to figure out what, what the catalyst is, what's different on your system than systems that aren't having problems. So posting in the PFSense forums is the best way to get that addressed. I enjoy your videos because I have an interest in Unify and PFSense. That's awesome. You need to bring back to how they got hacked. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know. We got to do something. Um it's challenging. We would love to do that. You're right with me, Matt, and Jason. For your small clients, do you provide full MSP or are they more break fix? Uh, MSP. We the, we do break fix work. We still do it. But someone was mad yesterday because we couldn't do it the same day. They wanted consulting on a problem and they were upset that we didn't have immediate availability for them. They were like called in the morning and wanted immediate availability. I'm like, I don't have the immediate availability for you uh, for this. So that's been kind of a challenge is scheduling them in. If we're not busy and I don't have a bunch of things scheduled, sometimes we do have same day availability, but yeah, we do break fix, but the break fix is kind of a challenge. We try to schedule people all the time because that's how you can be most efficient with your technicians. Keeping a technician twiddling his thumbs, waiting for someone to call, is challenging because you don't know because not every day someone wants the same day. Matter of fact, a lot of people are fine with scheduling out the service ahead of time. Yeah, I want to bring it back. It's figuring out timings with everybody. Xavier doesn't even live around here anymore. Matt Lee, I love Matt Lee. He travels a lot though. And so that's a challenge. Me and Jason, Jason has a lot of commitments as well. So we've talked about doing it. The problem is finding three people and lining their times up is hard. It's hard with two people. And me and Jay from Learn Linux TV were able to almost do quite a few home lab shows on Wednesdays. But even you notice we missed some, especially with the holidays and everything. Jay's gone this week again doing other things. So he was not able to make it. So he didn't do the home lab show. So that's a biggest challenge with those how uh, that. But I even if I bring it back, doing it myself on a regular cadence, that might be a fun way to do it. Um, and then I'll bring in others to join me as they have time. So that's kind of my thoughts on that. Like I'll, I'll run with it. I'll let them figure it out if they got time. Like I'll, I'll establish a time to do it and other people can figure out if that time works for them. And if it doesn't, I do it anyways. I, that's sometimes how I, how I do things. Uh, ask if I can come to a site a few hours from now. Um, no. Yeah. Can you have an MSP without break fix and still have customers? Um, the problem is if you want everybody to sign a contract, you're going to, you're going to narrow down the people that will choose you. Maybe you're getting rid of the people that won't, but the reality is if the only way you'll do work for someone is on contract, but they're skittish, they are worried whether or not you will be a good fit for them. This is the um, let's date before we get married problem of the MSP. 
they kind of want to know whether or not you're good at something before they sign a one-year commitment with you and get all of your tools loaded on their system. It's a big commitment for a company to switch IT companies if they have an existing one. But if they can work with you on a project, you can prove that you're someone uh, that you would actually be good at doing there. Yeah, I should do a collab with Cody. Um, Cody's great for sure. Uh, hot sauce vids, not likely. And I just say not likely because they, they don't perform well on the channel and I lose subscribers substantially because it's off topic from tech. Uh, thanks for the access camera engine. Ever used any outdoor housings that actually hold a full-size digital camera? Uh, nope, not. I mean, probably 10 years ago, but I have longer than that. I, I did one back in 2008. We had this specialized project for a school we did with special heated large housings. Uh, but yeah, no, that I haven't looked at anything like that in like 10, 12 years. Oh, I'm not... I'm not ready to go grab turkey yet. I just got to go go visit family that I have to leave and uh, get going on. So, but yeah, I guess I've ran this enough. I went another 15 minutes. No, you're absolutely right. No one's, but the thing is no one's messaging me that I should be somewhere else. So I can, I'll keep being here, but maybe I'll do another live stream over the weekend. Thank you all. Everyone have a happy Thanksgiving. Love hanging out with everyone. Hit me up in the forums. That's the easiest way to engage with me on a lot of these topics, especially if you want a more in-depth answer with a lot of links posted. The forums is a great place to find me over there. And thanks.